What is up, you guys? It's been a really exciting week here at Hardened Soil with the release of Firestarter. I've done a ton of videos previously on stearic acid and linoleic acid and why I am super excited about stearic acid containing fats like suet, which we made into the little Firestarter pills. We also released gut and digestion this week, and it's got me thinking a lot about gut stuff. It's been kind of percolating in my mind. I did a number of podcasts a few weeks ago with Vincent Pedre, Michael Ruscio, and Lucy Mayling about gut stuff. And I came across some articles that were really interesting looking at the seasonal variation of the human microbiome. I want to review some of those today. And I found another paper this morning that was so cool that I had to do a whole controversial thoughts starting with this one. So if you listen to the mainstream narrative today, they will tell you that fiber is good and you need more and more plant fiber. And the more plant fiber, the better. And they will say things like the Hadza eat 100 to 150 grams of fiber per day, which I think is completely incorrect and misleading. And I'll show you why in this video. And they'll say that's why they have a quote, healthy microbiome. That's why they have a diverse microbiome. Now, in this video, I'll also review a little bit of my microbial diversity report results from longevity, which showed that on a carnivore diet with honey, I have essentially a very high alpha diversity with zero fiber. So the notion that we need fiber for an increasing alpha diversity is false. I've shown this before. I've illustrated this before and shown you guys articles that say that when you increase fiber, alpha diversity doesn't increase. When you decrease fiber, alpha diversity doesn't decrease. And there's actually a great study that I'll pull up later in this video from Harvard, where they compared a complete carnivore diet for seven days to a plant-based diet. And the alpha diversity on the carnivore diet was no less than the plant-based diet. So if we're using alpha diversity as a metric of quote, gut health, uh, I think that there's really no evidence that fiber is beneficial. And I love to just crush these misleading narratives about the magic of fiber, because I think the fiber, the only thing fiber does is really make you poop more. It makes you fart more. And those are not good things. And I think it's pretty clear we can get a very healthy gut and live healthy lives without fiber. And for those who are suffering without fiber, uh, for suffering in their diet, eliminating fiber can be very helpful. I've talked about that in the past as well. So if you are having gut issues, I think this is a great video for you if you're imagining that you must have fiber in your diet. And I think that the nutrients found in things like tripe and intestines and liver and spleen and pancreas can definitely be helpful for healing leaky gut. Um, these are things like BPC-157, zinc, uh, copper, molybdenum, folate, biotin, riboflavin. These are crucial nutrients to heal the gut. And um, I'm excited about uh, gut indigestion at hardened soil. But check out this paper, you guys. So if you're watching this on Instagram, you'll see the video. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see the video. If you're listening on my podcast, I'll try and describe it to you, but um, you may want to go back and look at the video. The title of this paper really says it all. Tubers as fallback foods. Fallback foods, I've said that word before, and their impact on Hadza hunter-gatherers. This is a study of Hadza hunter-gatherers from 2009, where they actually went to Africa to live with the hunter-gatherers of the Hadza tribe, and they rank, they had them rank all of the foods in their diet. Essentially, the Hadza diet is composed of five types of food. Uh, honey, interestingly, we'll get into a little bit of honey controversy today too. Um, there is no such thing as big honey, and uh, this video is not sponsored by big honey because it doesn't exist, and anyone that suggests otherwise is ridiculous. Um, honey, uh, tubers, meat, and berries and the boabab fruit. And they had them rank all of those. And as you see here in the abstract, and I'll dig into this paper in more detail, honey was ranked the highest by both men and women. Tubers, as expected from their low calorie value, were ranked the lowest by both men and women. Interesting. Isn't it really cool to see anthropologic evidence that substantiates a lot of the things that we think within the carnivore animal-based framework? That tubers are fallback food. Fruit and berries and honey are more preferential than tubers. And we know that meat is probably preferential to all of those, though the Hadza would choose honey over meat. But meat is ranked second by the men. And then we'll talk about the women as well. So really interesting stuff. Even the, even the Hadza think of tubers as fallback food. And as you'll see later in this paper, when there is a kill, they, the women don't dig tubers for a number of days as they are eating animals. This is the type of thing that I've been saying for years now, guys, that when animals are available, when our ancestors can get more uh, preferable foods, in this case for the Hadza, honey or meat or berries, they're not going to go digging tubers. And they certainly don't like a whole lot of fiber in their diet. And we'll talk about why. So you can see this paper is really interesting. It's a great summary of the types of tubers they eat, this equa. 
uh, there's Vigna frutensis, a lot of these Vigna species, the types of berries they eat, the meat they eat, the boabab tree. Uh, they mostly eat the boabab fruit. They don't eat the seeds and the honey from a number of stinging and stingless bees. There are two major species, excuse me, two major seasons in Hadza, Hadza land. Uh, considerable rain December through May and almost no rain June through November. So there's a wet season and a dry season. And those are going to be important in a paper I'm going to discuss later from Justin Sonnenberg, looking at the differential variation in the gut flora among these different seasons. Hogs and men usually go foraging alone. They have an ax to access honey. It's pretty cool. And grown men usually don't dig tubers. The tubers that are most eaten are this Vigna frutensis. And I got some pictures of that to show you guys as well. Um, but here is the ranking of uh, the preferences. Males clearly favor honey and meat crushes everything else. Tubers are really just fallback food. Tubers are survival food for these people, in my opinion, clearly. And women also. Interestingly, women don't often go hunting for meat. Women uh, also rank meat second. So women rank honey first, meat second. Men rank honey first, meat second. And the only difference between women, uh, actually, I got this wrong. Women rank uh, honey first, and then the meat, berries, and boabab are all actually pretty significantly the same. They're all kind of equal, and uh, tubers are much less. But men clearly have a preference for honey, and then meat, and then followed by boabab, then berries, and then tuber. Now, you can look at the availability throughout the year. There's a lot of seasonal variation in the variability uh, of what these are, uh, how the availability of these. But the investigators of this agree that tubers are really fallback foods. Now, one of the things I found interesting in this article, I really want to go to Hadza land. I'm hoping to go next year with one of my friends and spend some time among the Hadza. But this is something that I want to highlight. Hadza women also skip digging for tubers for two or three days running when there's a lot of meat in camp. They prefer animal foods. If you can get animals, you don't go digging for fallback foods, which are tubers. Our ancestors probably ate tubers when they could get them. But if you can get animals, these are the preferred foods, and especially even honey is a really preferred food, though there's a lot of seasonal variability in when you can get honey. Now, the other thing that I thought was very interesting in this paper was that the majority of the fiber in the tubers is spit out. So they actually mentioned this, and I'll find the spot where they talk about it. They're, the amount of fiber in, these, they're, in the Hadza diets, I believe, has been misquoted. And I believe it's been misquoted because if you read these studies, so much of the fiber in these, uh, in these tubers gets spit out. They're not actually eating this fiber. So it's right here in the paper. And if this is true, how do we actually know how much fiber they're eating? So the species eaten most frequently by the Hadza is the Equa, Vigna, Frutesis, Frutescens. All of their tubers have high fiber content, but it is so high in the Equa that one cannot swallow it and must spit out the quid after chewing it for a while. So they don't even eat this fiber. It's basically, this is garbage food. This is survival food. This is fallback food, you guys. It's not something that's a big part of their diet. And I don't even think they're getting a lot of this fiber, but they're spitting it out. The other thing they mentioned in this paper is that because the kids are forced to eat so much fiber, when you look at pictures of these poor kids, they have these protuberant bellies. And that doesn't sound good to me very much either. So you can see in this picture, this kid over here has a pretty distended belly. Oftentimes they're mistaken for this condition called kwashiorkor, which is protein calorie malnutrition. And here's a Facebook post from Human Food Project, which is connected with Jeff Leach. These guys are clearly interested in the Hadza microbiome and in favor of fiber, but they say the high fiber diet results in enormous bellies among the kiddos, often mistaken as malnutrition, which they misprint here as kishwar and is probably meant to be kwashi or core. Um, but isn't that interesting? Do we want kids to have a huge protuberant belly? I don't think this is a good thing at all. You can see this is the women cooking the equa. And this again is another picture of the women cooking the equa in Hadza land. But isn't this an interesting idea that in Hadza land, tubers are the fallback food. They are clearly the fallback food. Women dig them when the males are out hunting as a fallback food in case they don't have animals. When animals come into camp, with a successful hunt, they don't even dig tubers any longer. And the kids get these protuberant bellies. I have noticed in my own life that I feel so much better when I have a low fiber diet. My stomach feels less distended. When I've gone back to fiber with squash, not only did it tr tr trigger my eczema, but I got this distended belly. It just felt stretched and I couldn't get enough of the meat and organs that I know are more nutrient dense. I think that 
sadly, among humans living today, if we eat too much fiber, we are going to push out the more nutrient dense animal foods. As you guys have all heard me say, I'm not against eating some plant foods, but I think we should understand there's a hierarchy of plant foods. And even among Hadza's, Hadza hunter gatherers, which are a lot of our ancestry is here. These are the original, these are the descendants of often the original, what might be considered to be the original Homo sapiens or the original Homo ancestors, hominid ancestors. They prefer lower fiber honey and berries, boabab, and then meat to the tubers, which are very high fiber, so much so that they even have to spit it out. Another really cool paper here talks about honey among hunter gatherers and shows where in the world they, honey is used. And basically throughout these regions of the middle part of the US, Northern South America, the middle part of Africa, the Indonesia, <clears throat> Northern Australia, wherever they can get honey, they use honey. So this paper is Honey, Hadza, Hunter Gatherers, and Human Evolution. They describe and analyze widespread honey collection among foragers, show that where it is absent in Arctic and subarctic habitats, honeybees are also rare or absent. And they focus on the Hadza specifically, they, corroborate the fact that both Hadza men and women rank honey as their favorite food. Uh, virtually all warm climate foragers consume honey. Our closest living relatives, the great apes, take honey when they can as well. This group of researchers from 2014 suggests that honey has been a part of the diet of our ancestors dating back to at least the earliest hominins. Isn't that cool? I think that's really interesting. Now, one thing that is often criticized by others in the animal-based community is what about the oral health of us when we consume honey. Isn't this going to give us cavities? And I say it's not. You can listen to the podcast that I did with Al Dannenberg, who's a periodontist. All of those are listed at heartandsoil.co.co. And in that paper, in that podcast, and the recent podcast with Ben Beekman that came out earlier this week, I referenced a number of papers showing that honey has antibacterial properties, anti-cavity fighting properties, and has been used for oral candida and oral mucositis. Nevertheless, People who persist in saying that um, honey can cause cavities will cite this one paper. And I talked about this one in the podcast with Ben Beekman, Oral Health in Transition, the Hadza Foragers of Tanzania. The first thing they notice here is that they did a comprehensive study of oral health among living population of Hadzas in transition from bush to village life. It's kind of like modern day Weston A. Price, uh, the Hadza hunter gathers. And they found that women uh, living in villages consuming a mostly agricultural diet exhibited more caries and periodontal disease than those living in the bush consuming a mostly wild food diet. Now pause there and think about this. It's important to note that the women living in the bush also rate honey as their favorite food. They're consuming a lot of honey. They have significantly less cavities and periodontal disease than the women living in villages. I talk about this in my book, The Carnivore Code. If you are living in a village, you are getting less of the fat soluble vitamins. Cavities are fat soluble vitamin deficiency. They're not honey caused, or at least they don't seem to be. And there are many things that would argue against that. Then they go on to make this statement, which is really important to unpack. Men living in the bush, consuming a mostly wild food diet, had more cavities than those living in the village consuming a mostly agricultural diet. And that was interesting. But what they said here is that the unexpected discovery of high caries incidents in men in the bush is likely explained by, they hypothesize, a heavy reliance on honey, which I disagree with, and perhaps differential access to tobacco and marijuana. And this is the part of the paper that is often left out when people are trying to say that honey causes cavities. I think that it's pretty clear this is tobacco and marijuana because the women are also consuming honey and they don't get more cavities. And honey is the same between both of those groups or pretty darn similar because men bring two thirds of their honey harvest back to camp. You can find that listed in the first paper that I mentioned in this article. But the men in the bush are smoking more tobacco and more marijuana. So that is probably what is causing them to have more cavities, not their access to honey. And again, we must remember that in both groups, the men and the women, there is a preference for honey. There's a clear preference for honey and they are both eating this in large amounts. So it wouldn't make sense for the men to have more cavities than the women if they're both consuming lots of honey, if honey was the main driver. And as I've noted previously, there are a lot of studies suggesting that honey has antibacterial properties in the mouth. If you have any doubts about the physical health of the Hadza, there are lots of studies um, suggesting that they are extremely cardiovascularly healthy, despite including up to 15 to 20% of their calories as honey. That's a lot of quote sugar uh, that I don't think is a big deal at all in this case because it's a, uh, a native sugar. It's evolutionarily consistent. They spend a lot of time walking around. They have low blood pressure. Uh, they have low uh, markers of C protein and they have good health markers and they don't really have 
major evidence of cardiovascular disease. So where is the problem with honey when these foragers are eating it in large amounts? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. This is a myth, you guys. We're being led astray. We should not fear this. Obviously, don't eat it at the exclusion of other nutrient-rich foods. Get your fat-soluble vitamins and minerals, which is why we need to eat organs, why we make things like beef organs and bone marrow and liver at hardened soil, or you can just eat the organs fresh, why you should get the fat-soluble nutrients, eating it with fat, like fire starter, and why things like gut and digestion are important to get those unique nutrients in tripe and stomach in connection with liver, spleen, and pancreas. But for anyone to say that honey is causing cavities in these people is to have an incomplete understanding of the literature. And the other thing I wanted to show is that tubers are the fallback food. And most of the fiber from that is spit out. It's spit out. Now, I want to show a few other papers. I want to link to that paper I mentioned earlier showing the lack of variation in the alpha diversity of the gut with zero fiber diets, because that's an important one. So I've quoted this paper before. The name of it is diet rapidly and reproducibly alters the gut microbiome. If anyone tells you that fiber increases the alpha diversity of the gut, you show them this paper and the other ones that I've mentioned previously showing that removing fiber doesn't decrease the alpha diversity of the gut. And there are other interventional papers in which they give people more fruits and vegetables and the alpha diversity doesn't go up either. So they basically compared two groups. They looked at um, a group that was entirely animal-based, an animal-based diet, and a group that was plant-based. And what they found, if you look at the end of this, is that there was no difference and the alpha diversity between these two groups. I think that this is a group at Harvard that believes <laughs> that this can't possibly be true or this can't possibly be um, a good thing. So they're writing it in a way that makes it look bad, but you can see their plant-based diet, animal-based diet. Here's the fiber intake. Here's the fat intake. Here's the protein intake. Here's the alpha diversity. Didn't change significantly at all when you remove the fiber and the alpha diversity of the plant-based diet didn't increase. You can see the alpha diversity is trending essentially exactly along the same line on these. These are the um, sort of uh, error bars. So it gives you a sense of the standard deviations here. But you can see the beta diversity actually increased on the animal-based diet. Beta diversity is interspecies variation. Alpha diversity is uh, variation within a certain ecosystem. So that is an interesting thing. One interesting piece of this that I would also like to mention is that if you look at the actual microbiome of the Hadza hunter-gatherers, a lot comes out. So like I said, there's a wet season and a dry season. And I'm gonna show you a paper from Justin Sonnenberg, who's very pro-fiber, and I wanna get him on the podcast because I disagree with him strongly about this. Um, they show a lot of seasonal variation in the type of organisms in the wet season and the dry season. In the dry season, they eat a lot more meat, and in the wet season, they eat a lot more berries and or other foods. And so there's a real difference in the microbiotic composition. But what you will find if you look at the Hadza microbiome is that they, have. Now, remember, this is a population of free living hunter gatherers that are pretty healthy. They don't have rampant inflammatory bowel disease. They don't have rampant uh, colon cancer that we know of. They don't have rampant bowel disease at all. Anyone would look at them and say they have a healthy gut. But if you look at the guts of them, of the hunter gatherers from the Hadza, when they've been analyzed, the enterocyte associated microbiome of Hadza hunter gatherers, the Hadza enterocyte microbiome was characterized by a greater amount of adhesive microorganisms with a pathogenic potential, such as proteobacteria. Uh, these are Enterococcus, Clostridium, uh, Sarcina, and Erysipelotrichiaceae. <laughs> That's a big one. Now, what's so interesting to me is that these researchers don't seem to be able to see the forest for the trees. They, Justin Sonnenberg found the same thing, that during the dry season, the, the microbial composition of the Hadza gut began to look more like a quote, Western gut as they ate more meat. And so all these researchers just kind of want to go into their echo chamber and say, aha, we found it. They have these pathogen associated uh, bacteria, but the context is what's being missed. The Hadza don't have GI disease. They don't have inflammatory bowel disease. How can we make blanket statements like the proteobacter uh, species or the, the species or the genus proteobacter, excuse me, the proteobacter phylum the, the phyla, proteobacter, how can that be characterized as unanimously bad? We are in our infancy in understanding the gut microbiome. And everyone, including Justin Sonnenberg, all these researchers appear to want to jump the gun and say, we know these species are bad. But in the Hadza, who don't have inflammatory bowel disease, why can, how can we say that increasing amounts of proteobacter is a bad thing? It doesn't make any sense. It's jumping the gun. The other interesting thing about the Hadza microbiome, if you do your research, is that they don't contain bacteroides. <laughs> 
they actually, excuse me, I misspoke. They don't contain bifidobacteria. So as you'll see in this one, they, they, have, um, they actually don't have bifidobacterium. These include an absence of bifidobacterium, but they have a healthy gut. They don't have gut disease. They don't have gut issues. They don't have gastric inflammation. They don't have inflammatory bowel disease. So this really challenges our notion of what a healthy gut microbiome is because so many of the metrics that we are using to define a microbiome as quote healthy in Western society, we see being directly challenged in a hunter-gatherer group that considers tubers to be fallback foods, higher rates, uh, higher amounts of proteobacteria phyla, no bifidobacteria. We don't know what a healthy gut microbiome is. A healthy gut microbiome is the microbiome that you or I have when we are healthy, when we are pooping regularly, when we don't have gas, bloating, or constipation, when you don't have gut issues. There are many ecological niches within your gut that can be occupied by many different types, species, subspecies of bacteria, fungi, all these types of things. For us to say we know what a healthy gut microbiome is, this is incredibly myopic, and I disagree with it wholeheartedly. I think that some people can have a healthy gut microbiome eating plant fiber, and many of us can have a completely healthy gut microbiome without fiber. There are many ways that we can have a healthy gut microbiome. There are seasons to the microbiome in the gut. So this is another really cool paper, seasonal cycling in the gut microbiome of the Hadza hunter gatherers of Tanzania. What you see here is they followed 27 hunter gatherers. They were just following them around with poo cups, I guess. And they see that seasonally there was significant variation in the types of species. And they say, the data reveal annual cyclic reconfiguration of the microbiome in which some taxa have become undetectable only to reappear in a subsequent season. Now, you can see the bias is evident when they write this paper because they say that in the dry seasons, they had a microbiome that began to resemble a Western microbiome. And they're insinuating this is a bad thing. Now, even though it resembles a good Western microbiome, they don't look like Westerners. They don't get Western diseases of the gut. So this is the problem. And this exposes their bias. It's just the idea that Justin Sonnenberg, these researchers, whoever you're listening to that tells you fiber is good for you, doesn't know what a healthy mi gut microbiome is. And just like a, a hunter-gatherer tribe, if you want to do eating a diet that's more protein and fat rich, and it changes your gut microbiome in a certain way, and you feel better, how can anyone argue that's a bad thing? It cannot, they cannot. The other thing that's interesting to note is that microbiota, organisms that disappeared, reappeared the next season when they started eating more foods. Maybe there's some ability to cycle with the microbiome. This came up in the podcast I did with Lucy Mailing, And I think it's a suggestion that even if we lose uh, bacteria or organisms in terms of shotgun sequencing analysis, they can often come back. We don't lose them temporarily. Do we need them in the first place? I think this paper suggests, my interpretation is that there are many ways to have a healthy gut microbiome and that you don't need plant fiber, most of which they're spitting out in the first place from the tubers. And I think these estimates that they're eating 100 to 150 grams of fiber per day are ludicrous. And as I said, I'll show you my results from longevity showing that I have a very diverse gut microbiome, if you think that that's an, uh, an accurate measure of the alpha diversity, with zero plant fiber in my diet. I also happen to like honey and I eat it reasonably uh, regularly. I don't eat it every day anymore, but I do eat it regularly. Uh, I'll probably lessen the honey in the winter season, have some seasonal variation in my diet. I've been experimenting with that as well. But in summary, I found all this very interesting. And I, from my perspective, again, I want to do a podcast with Justin if he'll come on. I've tried to get other fiber pro vegan docs on my podcast and they won't do it. I have to chase them down. It's ridiculous. Um, but I think this really reveals to us that we don't understand what a healthy gut microbiome is. And that for researchers to say that a population of free living hunter gatherers who's clearly healthy, that does not have GI issues is unhealthy because their gut microbiome has higher amounts of proteobacteria is ludicrous. It's complete bias. We don't need to have the gut microbiome that's Justin Sonnenberg desires us to have. We can have a gut microbiome that serves us and maybe it has a higher amount of proteobacteria, but we don't understand how all these species are connected. They're intricately connected. There are many ecological niches. And if you are feeling good with less fiber or zero fiber, you are doing great. There's no evidence that fiber prevents cancer. I've talked about this all in the past. I think what's most important is that we understand that there are unique nutrients that are necessary to have a healthy gut. I think of a healthy gut as two big pieces getting rid of the things that are pissing off your gut, lectins, other plant toxins that are harming the gut, other you know, heavy metals, whatever you're eating in your diet, glyphosate, gluten. I'm gonna do a whole separate video, which I'll release 
later this week or next week on blood type diets in which I will really talk about lectins. But there are many things in our diet, specifically from plants a lot of the time, saponins, that can damage our gut lining. I talk about this in my book. The second piece is getting the nutrients you need to heal your gut. Where do you get those? One of the reasons I'm so excited about the gut and digestion formula from Heart and Soil is that it has tripe and stomach. Tripe gastric juices have BPC-157. This is a peptide that is known to be tonic that is helping us heal our body. And if you're going to build a gut, if you're gonna build an intestinal lining, the nutrients for that are probably present in the intestinal lining, in the stomach, in the intestines, and we combine it with liver and pancreas and spleen to give you all the digestive enzymes, the beneficial peptides in spleen, splenin, splenopentin, tuftsin, and all the unique benefits of liver, folate, zinc, riboflavin. We know these things are necessary for a healthy gut. So I'm really excited about that to give you guys back the nutrients to fortify your gut once you take out the negative stuff. So I'm gonna show you my gut results from longevity so I want to give a shout out to these guys. I really appreciate what they do. It's actually a pretty interesting analysis. I will say they, they gave this one to me for free. I'm not getting paid to do anything like this for longevity. I just want to share my results. It's interesting if you have questions. So this is Paul Saladino's results. My gut bio, the report was created 7-30-2020. So you can see here my microbiota inflammation score is minimal. This is on a completely carnivorous diet with honey, you guys. Um, I have a minimal microbiome inflammation score. And this is, again, within the context of what is probably a biased perspective, a, um, a skewed perspective. Uh, I think that many of these organisms, these species that we consider to be harmful, it's all context dependent. How can we say this one is so bad, right? How can we say that Blaudia producta is so bad? Um, I clearly don't have a lot of inflammation in my gut. Uh, microbiome-based diarrhea score, minimal. <laughs> I don't have diarrhea. I have beautiful poops every day. Diversity score, great. 94% or less diverse than me, or 6% or more diverse. I'll challenge any plant-based physician <laughs> to show me your diversity score, see if it's any higher than mine. I doubt it. Goes on. Immune readiness score. I'm in there. Okay, great. Micronutrients. Now, this is indicating what my gut microbiome can do. My gut microbiome doesn't have to contribute to my nutrients because I get these in my diet. <laughs> so I don't think our gut microbiome should be making a lot of these because I get tons of folate in liver with a bone marrow and liver supplement, a beef organ supplement, B6 in meat, niacin, B12, you guys get it. Short chain fatty acids are quite interesting. I do make lactate, there's propionate, there's valerate. One thing they didn't look in here look at in here is isobutyrate. If you listen to the podcast with Lucy Mailing, I make a lot of isobutyrate. So we can make isobutyrate from protein and fat. And as we know, um, you don't just need to make butyrate. I do make some, but because I'm not eating a lot of plant fiber, it's going to be skewed. People are going to say, oh, you don't make enough butyrate. Well, I make other short chain fatty acids, including isobutyrate, which isn't listed here. And those can all be used by the clonic epithelial cells. Moving on, gives me a huge list of probiotics, which I will not take because I don't need to. I have a pathogen score, which is normal, meaning I don't have any of these nasty bugs. And breaks down the phyla, which is quite interesting. Only 34.44% of tax in my gut were identified, meaning, my goodness, 65% of the tax in my gut, we don't even know what's in there. <laughs> Unknown, 65%. How do we think we know anything about that gut microbiome <laughs> when you can't even tell me 65% of the microbiota in there? Yet we think we can construct a healthy, a healthy microbiome, or we think you know exactly what it should look like. It's baloney. Keystone taxa, no methanobacteria, very low. Prevotella, fecal bacterium prasnusii, acromancia is high. This one actually gets high with time-restricted feeding. I'm in the middle with bifido, probably more like a Hadza. And look, I have proteobacteria. No surprise. Most people would look at this and go, aha, that's not healthy. You have proteobacteria. And I would say, what is it doing to me? I poop every day. It's easy to pass. I have amazing GI health. I don't fart. This is the context I'm talking about. The Hadza also get higher amounts of proteobacteria when they eat a more animal-based diet, but they don't get inflammatory bowel disease. Why do we think that we know that this is a bad thing? We don't know the context of this higher proteobacteria, and I will fight for this onward, you guys. They don't know that this is necessarily a bad thing. We're completely thinking about this in a myopic, biased, context. Community breakdown. This is everything they've done. They're recommending a whole food diet. No, thanks. 
oh, it's actually sponsored by Trifecta. No, thanks. No, thanks. I think I'm just going to go eat some, uh, uh, nope, no, thanks. Don't need a probiotic. Don't need fiber mend. Don't need any of that stuff. I'm just going to go back to eating meat and organs, honey, and occasional fruit on my carnivore-ish diet. But you can see, there it is. Plant-based doctors, high fiber doctors come at me. Show me your higher diversity score. So I thought all this was really cool. In summary, I found it fascinating that within Hadza hunter-gatherer communities, tubers were a fallback food, clearly indicated by them to be that way, that honey was favored, that honey doesn't cause cavities. It's probably the tobacco and the marijuana. And um, there are many studies that show that. I'll show one real quickly. So if you have any doubt about smoking being associated with dental cavities, correlation between tobacco smoking and dental caries, a systematic review and meta-analysis, there's a correlation between tobacco smoking and increased risk of dental caries. So it's pretty clear. 10 out of 11 studies, including uh, positive association between tobacco smoking, dental caries, two meta-analyses were performed. Again, this is all associational epidemiology, but pretty strong associations here. You can generate some pretty darn good hypotheses that should be tested by interventional studies. It's hard to do interventional studies with this. It's not super, um, not super... Uh, looked upon, uh, well, it's not, not very ethical is the word I'm looking for to do studies where you have a smoking and a non-smoking group anymore, but you guys get the idea. I don't know why we believe that um, <clears throat> smoking would be associated, would not be associated with dental cavities, but I think you can make a real strong argument this is going on. And I think that the evidence against honey is very shaky. Now, I just want to show one more thing. Um, it was a really beautiful picture in the science article from the uh, previous paper that I mentioned from Justin Sonnenberg uh, showing a Hadza hunter-gatherer eating honey. If that doesn't get you excited about honey, I don't know what will. But in summary, as I said, tubers are fallback foods. Honey is preferenced. Meat is hugely valuable. It's eaten at the exclusion of other foods. I showed you that. Kids get protuberant, distended bellies when they eat so much fiber. That can't be good for kids. Come on. Uh, they're spitting out a lot of the fiber because it's so fibrous. These are not good food for humans. They're fallback foods. Why are we prioritizing those? It's silly. We don't need tons of fiber. Even if you don't have a lot of fiber, you may shift more toward proteobacter. You'll still have a very diverse microbiome like I do. And we don't know that proteobacter is a bad thing in this context. Different phyla, different species can look different in different contexts. This is what I believe about the gut microbiome. We are in its infancy. Longevity can't even tell me what 65% of my microbiome is, but the rest of them, it looks pretty good. I have a high diversity and I can't wait to debate some gut-focused, fiber-focused physicians if they stop running from me. Check us out at Heart and Soil, you guys, heartandsoil.co.co. We released Firestarter yesterday. Huge thing. We're super excited. Gut and digestion, tripe, stomach, liver, pancreas, spleen. Let us know what you think of these. You can always email Dr. Paul, drpaul at heartandsoil.co if you have questions. I love you all. I'm releasing this on Instagram, YouTube. It'll be on my podcast later this week. Email me with questions or concerns. Stay radical. Go get it.